Hello and welcome to part one of the four-part Inference with the Normal Distribution series. If you haven't checked out the introduction, please do so before watching this video. This video is mainly going to be focused around the chi-square distribution, several examples of which are shown in this plot with different degrees of freedom. One can see that with degrees of freedom equal one, I just want you to have these pictures in your head, the chi-square distribution is somewhat of an exponential shape to it, whereas as we increase the degrees of freedom from 1 to 5 and 5 to 10, you can see that we start to develop peaks in our distribution, and these peaks start to move to the right. Now, just a brief historical note, the chi-squared introduction was sort of made famous by Pearson in some of his work in the early 1900s. not going to show a picture because you can guess what he looks like, another old and serious European dude. And uh, I'll also note that, yes, indeed, he was also an asshole, a eugenist to the core. So. A few facts to recall before we start with this video, right? Uh, I first wanted to recall the density function for a gamma distribution because that's going to come into play. Now, I encourage you on this slide to pause and write these sort of down for yourself as notes so you can kind of refer back to them as we move through the video. So a random variable y has a gamma alpha theta distribution if its PDF has the following form here, right? So we've got 1 over theta to the alpha gamma to the alpha y to the alpha minus 1, and then e to the minus y over theta. And you might also recall that we usually refer to alpha as the shape parameter and theta as the scale parameter. So the next fact to recall is that if you do have a gamma distribution, then its expected value and variance are given by alpha of theta, so this is e of y, and alpha theta squared, which is variance of y. Those formulas will also come in handy as we progress through this video. All right. Third, if y1 and y2 are independent gamma random variables with a common scale parameter but two possibly different shape parameters, then adding them together, so taking y equals y1 plus y2, is also results in a gamma distribution, and its shape parameter will be the sum of the previous two shape parameters. Now, this is a fact that one could prove using moment generating functions, for example, or actually using the 2D transform methods that we'll introduce later in video two. Finally, just a couple facts about the standard normal. We usually use the Greek letter phi, which I'll sometimes write as this, but oftentimes it's written as that as well, uh, to denote the PDF for the standard normal distribution, and also recall that standard normal has mean zero and SD1. So, the chi-squared distribution, our story sort of begins by considering the square of a standard normal distribution. Now, we've already talked about some techniques for dealing with one-dimensional transforms by looking at the CDF of the transformed variable. So let's follow that technique here as well by looking at the probability that y is less than or equal to some value little y. Well, simply substituting for y in terms of z results in the equivalent statement that z squared is less than or equal to y. And if we solve this inequality for z and we're careful with our square roots, we'll note that this is equivalent to saying that z is between negative square root of y and positive square root of y. Right? And using properties of the, or just using the standard notation for the CDF of the normal, so we're going to use phi sub z as the CDF of the normal. We could rewrite this expression as capital phi of square root of y minus capital phi of negative square root of y. Now, moving from CDF to PDF, we need to take derivatives. So if I differentiate the expression above, right, we'll use the chain rule. So the derivative of this inside function is 1 over 2 square root of y. And then the derivative of the outer function will be little phi, the PDF of the standard normal. For the other function, when I take derivatives, I'm going to get one negative 1 over 2 square root of y, canceling the negative in front, times phi of negative square root of y. Right. And noting the symmetry of the normal PDF, we can rewrite this as simply 1 over square root y phi of square root of y, right? Because there's two quantities that are the same, so the two will cancel with the 1 half. Now, going back, I'm not going to flip back because that will just get confusing as hell for you, but hopefully you wrote down what the form of the normal PDF is. So we're going to plug in square root of y for z into that formula, and we'll get 1 over square root of y times 1 over square root of 2 pi 
times e. Uh, now, remember, it's z squared, so that's going to give us just a y over 2. All right. Now, this is going to be a formula that will hold for y greater than or equal to 0, because obviously with this square here, our random variable can only take on non-negative values. Now, let's look carefully at the shape of this resulting d PDF, or just the form of this resulting PDF. Okay. What I'm going to do is just, I'm going to rewrite it slightly as a 1 over 2 to the 1 half. I'm going to leave this square root of pi right here. And then I'm going to write y in kind of a funky way as 1 half minus 1 here, but that obviously will give me that negative 1 half power. And then again here, negative y over 2. Now the reason why I want to do this is to compare this with the gamma PDF from the previous page. If you compare it with the gamma PDF, 1 over theta to the alpha, gamma to the alpha, y to the alpha minus 1, e to the y over theta, right? we can see that there is some matchup in the resulting quantities. So theta, for example, has to be 2. right? That kind of comes just from looking at these exponents. Similarly, if we look at alpha, well, alpha has to be 1 half. Right. And sure enough, if this is the case, then theta to the alpha is 2 to the 1 half as required by what we got above. Right. But notice that a side effect of this, which is one of the facts we promised we'd show in these slides, is that gamma of 1 half, which is what you would get from using that alpha here, must be equal to square root of pi, which is the corresponding quantity that matches up in the expression above. Yay, we've done it. Finally, what I also wanted to mention here is that this specific form of the gamma distribution with parameters 1 half and theta is what we know as the chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom. Sorry, 1 half and 2 in specific. Right. So. That is what will define the chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom as. So this parameter down here is called the df. All right? And we'll, we'll come back and see where, where that comes into play in other problems. But notice here a couple other facts that follow from our recalls on the previous slide, that if we look at the expected value of z squared, right, the expected value of this random variable y, it's going to be alpha times theta. So it's just going to come out to be 1 in this case. And also notice that the variance of this random variable z squared of our chi-squared distribution is going to be 1 half times theta squared, so alpha times theta squared, which just comes out to be 2. Right, so a couple interesting properties to note there before we move on. Now, the next section in our development of the chi-squared distribution is to talk about the sum of the squares of a bunch of IID standard normal random variables. So suppose that z1 through zp are all IID standard normal random variables. We'd like to know what is the distribution of their sum of squares. So in other words, if we define a random variable y to be the sum i equals 1 to p of the zi, we'd like to know what is this distributed as, zi squared, excuse me. The answer is actually obvious if we recall the fact from a couple slides ago that this, if you add together gamma random variables, you simply add together their shape parameters. So we know, based on our work on the previous slide, that all of the zi squareds are chi-squared with one degrees of freedom, which is exactly the same as saying that they're gamma with shape parameter 1 half and scale parameter 2. So, just simply using that fact, we conclude that y, right, is going to be a gamma random variable. Well, we add together the shape parameters, but since all of the shape parameters are 1 half, the new shape parameter is just going to be p times 1 half, right? and the scale parameter stays the same. So this is what we call a chi-squared distribution with p degrees of freedom. It's simply a gamma with, uh, it's with the shape parameter p over 2 and scale parameter 2. And just like on the previous slide, we'll just conclude here by noting 
the expected value of y is the shape times the scale, right? Which is p, and the variance of y is the shape times the scale squared, which is 2p. So a couple facts to keep in mind. Uh, notice that this means that as we increase p, the the sort of shape of y, or at least the peak of y, shifts towards the right. And that was something we saw in those first couple pictures. Recall where we had sort of a situation where we had one chi-square distribution with low degrees of freedom. And then after we increased the degrees of freedom, we started to see something more like this. Right? So this is if we increase p, which is the degrees of freedom there. I also wanted to note that because the chi-squared arises as a sum of iid random variables, the CLT says that y should, in distribution, uh, you know, pro appropriately scaled and whatnot, approach a normal as, as p goes to infinity. Right? So the shape of this curve should look more and more normal as we increase p. Before we move on to our next video, I wanted to come back and discuss what all this chi-squared business has to do with the distribution of S, the sample standard deviation from our initial problem. Recall that S squared is defined as 1 over n minus 1 times the sum of the squared deviations of our independent observations yi from their sample mean squared. Right? So on the previous slide, we said that if I have a quantity z i, which is standard normal, right, then the sum of the zi squareds, if I have p of them, is chi-squared with p degrees of freedom. Now, in our case, we do have a sum of normal random variables squared, but it doesn't quite look right because two things, right? First of all, they're not standardized, right? So remember that if I have a random variable x, which is normal mu sigma, then the way to appropriately standardize is subtract its true mean and divide by its true standard deviation. So I don't have its true mean, and I also don't have a division by its standard deviation. But this isn't a problem. This is just a matter of algebraic manipulations. When you're trying to, when you have one expression and you're trying to get a different one, right, we just add, subtract, multiply, divide by what we need in order to get there. So first, to start making s squared look like a sum of squared standard normal random variables, we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by n minus 1. And that will just get rid of that pesky n minus 1 term out front, which we still don't understand, but will after this slide. Second, the next thing, our next goal is we want to have a minus mu in the numerator. So what we're going to do is add and subtract what we need. And I'm going to work this out on the side just so we can kind of keep our, our work separated. So I'm going to take the quantity yi minus y, y bar squared, and I'm going to add and subtract mu from the inside of this expression. You've probably seen a similar trick when you're deriving like the computational formula for the variance, for example. Right. Squaring out the terms in parentheses, we'll get yi minus mu squared. The cross terms, after factoring out a negative 1, can be written as 2 times yi minus mu times y bar minus mu. And the final term can be written as a plus y bar minus mu squared. And again, I encourage you to pause at these points and work these sorts of algebraic inequalities out for yourself as well. So plugging all this back into our expression on the left side of the screen, we're going to obtain a sum of three terms here. The first one, yi minus mu squared, is looking good. That's looking close to our standard normal. As long as I divide by sigma, we should be good, right? The second one, after I factor out that constant term, y bar minus mu simplifies to a sum of yi minus mu. And then the third just simplifies to n times y bar minus mu squared. Now, the trick here is to notice that this sum in blue is equivalent to n times y bar minus n times mu. Right, y bar recall is one over n times the sum of the yi. So the sum of the yi is n times y bar. Right. So once we make note of this, we'll note that after factoring out n, 
and excuse that random blue strike there, we get n times y bar minus mu. Notice that now I'm going to have a 2n times y bar minus mu squared and another plus n times y bar minus mu squared so that this whole quantity here will simplify to a sum of yi minus mu squared right, minus n times y bar minus mu squared. So how does this help us? Well, let's divide all of these quantities by sigma squared at this point. Okay, Sigma squared, sigma squared, sigma squared. Okay. So the first quantity n minus 1 s squared over sigma squared. That's the one we don't know the distribution of, but we'd like to know its distribution. Now, this first one here is a chi-squared distribution with n degrees of freedom. I know that because it's a sum of IID, standardized normal random variables now, right? Standard normals. The third one, right? I just need to do one more algebraic manipulation, which is to write that one as y bar minus mu over sigma root n squared. Look familiar? It should, right? We know that sigma over square root of n is the standard deviation of the sample mean. Therefore, this last one is a single normal random variable squared. So that means this one is chi squared with one degrees of freedom. Now we're going to come back to this issue later, the fact that yi, uh, that this that that these this this one is actually independent of this. But notice that we end up here with a difference of two chi squareds, and it turns out that the s squared and the chi squared with one degrees of freedom are independent of each other. We'll show that in a later video, and therefore, using our sum of gamma random variables fact, we can conclude from this that this one is chi-squared with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. Right. Now, take a moment to digest this slide. I know there's a lot of information to go to. But notice how this last one right here, this last fact, is actually the answer to the age-old question, why the n minus 1? Right? The n minus 1 creeps up because we now know that this quantity is chi-squared with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So using facts delivered from a previous slide, we can say that the expected value of n minus 1 s squared over sigma is the degrees of freedom, n minus 1. Right? If we simplify, we get that expected value of s squared is, excuse me, not expected value, but just sigma squared. And you'll recall from an earlier video that when you have an estimator, right, and its expected value is equal to the quantity that you're attempting to estimate, you can say that that quantity is unbiased for sigma squared. Isn't that cool? All to get this neat fact. So in the next video, we'll come back to 2D transformations. And a part of that 2D transformation idea, by the way, is going to be to show that this quantity and this quantity are independent of each other, this chi-squared and this one. right? Uh, so keep that in mind. Put a pin in it for now. We'll come back to it later. Hope you enjoyed this first video.